And what I found was everywhere I went, I would connect with locals by dancing with them. And it wasn't about learning the dances. It was the immediate connection I would get from dancing with a complete stranger. And then these doors would open up. All of a sudden, we're invited to an Indian wedding in Mumbai the next day because we're salsa dancing at a club the night before. Or I'm in Uzbekistan and we're invited to a family meal of this woman making a, a whole like homemade plov in her home because we had met her son and from dancing. And I think there are these moments that it just clicked in my head where I was like, this is a magical key that I have to open every single door wherever I go. is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody. It's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Michaela Malazzi. She is the four-time Emmy award-winning host and executive producer of Bare Feet with Michaela Malazzi, a travel series highlighting the diversity of dance, which airs on PBS stations nationwide and on Amazon Prime Video globally. A professional dancer and trained musician, Michaela decided to start a journey around the world, taking her camera with her to follow dance in the lives of everyday people wherever she went. From rediscovering her family's heritage in Southern Italy, to dancing tango on the main stage in Buenos Aires. The series covers Michaela's adventures as she experiences the world one dance at a time. She has performed on numerous television shows, including Sesame Street and The Dr. Oz Show, and she has been featured in The New York Times, O Magazine, The Travel Channel, Forbes, National Geographic, Condé Nast Traveler, and the list goes on and on. And oh, by the way, did I mention she won four Emmys. Michaela, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Matt. First of all, can I say I love that you say my name absolutely perfectly because I never get that. I know it's a little thing, but it makes me so happy. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> well, I have watched enough of your series oh to God. memorize the pronunciation of your name because, of course, it is in the name of your show. And yeah. I am a big fan of what you're up to and what you are doing. So I'm super, super excited to have you here today. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, let's set the scene here before we start this interview and talk about where we are doing this interview from today. We are not in person, unfortunately, because if we were, I would have brought a bottle of wine and we would be having this epic wine that we're doing it remotely, though. And I am actually based in Asheville, North Carolina today on the east coast of the U.S. And where are you? I love Asheville. My husband's from North Carolina, so we go through Asheville quite a bit. I'm in New York City. My love, my home, it is the favorite, my favorite city in the world. And it's my favorite place to always come back to. So I'm in New York right now. It's obviously different than it's been in quite a while, but it's the best city in the world, I think. I have to be honest with you. I have to agree with you. <laughs> it's really interesting, right? You know, normally when people ask me, like, what's your favorite city in the world? And when Americans are asking me, it just feels a little boring to give a city that's in the United States. So I want to say something, you know, more interesting and give international cities and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. if I'm being really honest, and New York City is the greatest city in the world. And the it reason is. I love New York so much, which we're going to get into because the season two of your series really highlighted this, is that New York City is basically the entire planet of Earth condensed into one city. It is. Yeah. That's what New York means to me. That's how I see New York. That's how I live through that city. And it was really important for me to create and highlight how I see the city. Because as a local, as a New Yorker, Nobody ever goes through Times Square if you're a New Yorker. It's the worst place in the world, <laughs> right? You, nobody ever wants to go through there. But it's all these incredibly diverse neighborhoods that really make up the beauty and diversity and, and color and smells and chaos that is New York. 
So awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about your backstory and how you fit into all of that. Can you talk a little bit about where you grew up and when you were coming up as a kid? How did you originally get into music and dance? Yeah, it's really funny because growing up, I can't remember when I started dancing. I've always been dancing. There was two years in my life when I was between three and five. I was the flower girl of every single family wedding that happened within that two-year period. And it was the first time that I could remember I was dressing up and they, you would go to these big... I, I'm Italian. Obviously, my last name has a lot of Zs in it. It's this huge party where everybody is dancing and there's all this live music and it, it's just this wonderful sense of community. And I grew up with that and having that those experiences very young. My nickname as a kid was Tutto Pepe, which means all pepper, because I was constantly moving and dancing. I was the first one on the dance floor and I was the last one to leave the dance floor, God knows how many hours later, you know? And there are all these pictures of me dancing. And from there, my parents realized, wow, she really loves to dance. Every time she hears music, she can't stop moving. So they enrolled me in dance classes. My, we had a, a family relative who owned a dance studio. So I had was trained, starting to be trained. I started my first dance classes when I was three, but your typical ballet, jazz, tap. And also my grandmother is this beautiful storyteller. She does voices. She's Italian. And we grew up with our grandparents, my sister and I, in Italy. So every Sunday we talked to them on the phone they were sort of these voices on the other end of the of the phone. One summer, every summer, either my grandfather would come over and stay with us for the summer or my grandmother would come. They'd swap every other year. So we were very close with my immediate family and my extended family. I come from a huge Italian family. And when I mean huge, like extended Italian family, first, second, third, fourth cousins, I know all of them. And we're very close. And growing up, especially now it's changed a bit because we're all sort of scattered around. But Every weekend was a cookout in my aunt's backyard or my other aunt's backyard or all of these like huge family gatherings. And I grew up putting on these shows with my cousins. Like my cousins now say, Michaela, you're doing exactly what you did when we were kids. Now you're just getting paid for it. Like <laughs> I get to make a TV show <laughs> and I get to boss people around um, and dress up in costume. And that's what I did to my poor little cousins that, that whole time. And it, I never thought of it that way until they said that, like, you're the same exact person we knew when we were a kid. So I, I grew up in this very loud, raucous Italian family. My parents are both from, they're both immigrants from Southern Italy in the same town in Minturno, which you, you meet that town, you meet the people of that town and my grandmother in our very first episode. But being Italian American and being a first generation American is a huge part of, of who I am, of my identity, my inspiration for this whole show. And also my sister, she is a wheelchair user. She has cerebral palsy. And she basically, my sister and I were complementary to each other. So my sister's the brains. She's like super techie. She has her own tech startup. She's brilliant. She's created a company that creates technology for people with disabilities to make all things accessible, technology, all this incredible stuff. And growing up, she was always using computers to be more independent. And I, on the other hand, because she can't use her arms or her legs, and so I would do all the things that she couldn't physically do. So I would be dancing and making music, but we were like this duo of constantly being creative together, and we'd wake up in the mornings and make songs together on our little Casio keyboard. So it was just this wonderful crazy home. You know, my father never went to school here. My mother came here when she was 11. And I think they just saw the United States as this place of endless opportunity. You know, that typical idea of what is that immigrant dream? How can we fulfill that for our children? And they worked day and night to allow my sister and I to have all these opportunities that they never had. So I never take that for granted. And I'm always very grateful for that. But what I've noticed too, is like having that Italian upbringing was a huge part of why I wanted to rediscover my roots through dance. That's how we ended up having our very first episode. And then taking that idea, I identify so strongly with the immigrant community. And that's always been a theme in all of the episodes, in all of the destinations, seasons one, season two, season three. But having that immigrant story has been the root of why I started this project to begin with. Now, growing up dancing, I fell in love with dance 
like I said, as a kid, grew up dancing my whole life. And, and I also played multiple instruments. I had the opportunity to take piano lessons, violin lessons are the city where I grew up in had this free music program. I don't think it exists anymore. You know, what's the first thing to be cut is are the arts, right? And so I just had such a full childhood of music, but I have to attest to the fact that my parents really saw how much I was moved by music and dance and really afforded me the opportunity to have that constant those dance classes. And, you know, I was a scholarship kid, so I would get scholarships to the the ballet school and the dance school and some of the music programs. And we really took advantage of these uh, programs that were either available through the public school system or through the city or all of these. And of course, private, again, my parents really worked so hard to give me those opportunities. Fast forward to college, I went to NYU for music. I decided... I'm not built like a dancer. You know, I'm not a ballet dancer. I'm stocky. I'm a little more muscular. I like to eat too much. I love food. (laughs) The Italian (laughs) culture is all based around food. Food is love, right? So if you aren't eating, that means something's wrong. I knew I wasn't going to be a professional dancer. And I thought, and I I wrote music. I was a, a composition major at NYU and eventually went into the music industry and loved it. And I loved the travel aspect of it. I was hanging out with rock stars and I had this whole other life. But within those years of going to school and and working in the music industry, I would save enough money because I studied abroad the summer between my sophomore and junior year, studied in Florence, Italy, and fell in love with my culture. Because being Italian-American and Italian are two very different things. And even as close as my family is from the generation that left Italy, because my parents spoke, speak the language, they actually speak a dialect. But once I was in Italy in the early 2000s, I was like, wow, this is so different. But I started to actually learn my language better because I was speaking dialect at home or hearing dialect at home. It was this rediscovery of myself, of where my family came from, why they left, You know, this whole sort of rediscovery of oneself and then applied for scholarships to study abroad again the following year in Rome. And from that, I was like, I need to travel as much as I can, at least once a year, because I had a full-time job. And it was this hunger for, and I did it inexpensively. So friends were studying. Uh, another friend the following year was getting a Fulbright in Budapest. So a whole bunch of us would like crash in his apartment. And we we went around Budapest, like, you know, in hostels and spending six bucks a night. I mean, you do it because you just want to be immersed in this new experience over and over again. And what I found was everywhere I went, I would connect with locals by dancing with them. And it wasn't about learning the dances. It was the immediate connection I would get from dancing with a complete stranger And then these doors would open up. All of a sudden, we're invited to an Indian wedding in Mumbai the next day because we're salsa dancing at a club the night before. Or I'm in Uzbekistan and we're invited to a family meal of this woman making a a whole like homemade plov in her home because we had met her son and from dancing. And I think there are these moments that it just clicked in my head where I was like, this is a magical key that I have to open every single door wherever I go because I can't speak with them, right? I can't speak their verbal language, but because I'm making an attempt to learn something that they love so much through the universal language of dance and music, I'm able to share a smile, share movement. I was thinking about this the other day of why there is this feeling of speaking or communicating through dance is because there is a synchronization right? I'm watching someone dance and I'm imitating them and I'm moving almost adjacent to them or parallel to them. And we're literally having the same conversations with our bodies together. So we're communicating together and being able to do that with a complete stranger over a matter of seconds, I think is a, my superpower, but B is also shows you how powerful dance can be. And so that's how Bare Feet kind of came about. I I, I kept traveling once a year internationally. I'd save up money. Eventually, I I quit the music industry. I got burned out, and I found dance again in my life. And I became a dance teacher in New York City. I was a professional dancer performing in Broadway productions and doing all this stuff. And then woke myself up in the middle of the night and had this aha moment where I saw it was like a projection on a screen of what Bare Feet is today. I saw myself traveling and dancing with these people. I saw myself wearing all these incredible costumes. I saw myself with a a camera crew. I saw myself winning awards. I saw myself on subway 
billboards. I saw all of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a TV show. And I had no TV background, no hosting background, nothing. And it was this intense journey of figuring it out. That is like my mantra. And my old boss in the music industry, he was tough as nails. Um, but he would always kind of like say to me, he's like, Michaela, figure it out. And then he'd walk out of the room if there was any sort of problem. And I'm just like, why don't you help me? <laughs> but it was the best learning experience because I am a constant problem solver from figuring out how to make the show, figuring out how to pitch the show, figuring out how to tell this story because no one really did travel through dance before me. I mean, there were some iterations and now there's a bunch and I love it, but it's the passion for dance and music that I couldn't ignore basically. So you had the passion for dance and music. You had the passion for travel and for other cultures and for connecting with them. Can you take us through the journey though, from that night when you had the idea and mm -hmm. you saw the vision and then you realize, oh, how am I going to make this a reality? How am I going to make this happen? Can you take us on that journey and tell us, I mean, I would love to hear the full story about how you actually pulled off the pilot episode. I've heard sort of uh, bits and pieces of that yeah. story, but how you pulled off the pilot episode and how you actually made this show become a reality. Yeah. So <laughs> to give you context, that night that I had that aha moment was 11 years ago, almost to the day. So that just tells you how much time it takes for something to come to fruition. So I had that sort of vision, woke up, and luckily in the middle of the night, when I had that, I, I wrote down like chicken scratch notes, like, so I wouldn't forget. Cause in the morning I looked over and I could barely read what I had written. And I was like, Oh yeah, this dance travel show. I worked in the music industry before that. So I reached out to friends who had worked in the entertainment industry. They're like, Oh, this is an interesting idea, but we can introduce you to some, maybe an executive or a third party production company. My goal was to be on travel channel. And again, this was back in 2010. So that's when travel channel actually was still airing travel content, which we all know they're not, they're doing ghost hunters and whatever that is. And it's fine. That's fine. But back then travel channel was like the ultimate goal. So I was pitching friends of mine were being very generous and saying, I think you should meet with this production company, give them a call, see if they'll meet with you. And I kept reaching out and it was your typical. And again, I, I didn't come from the TV industry. I had never been on camera. I'd never been on camera. I had never been on a production shoot. I didn't know anything about any of this, but I just knew it was a, a good idea. And so I would get on the phone and they're like, well, this is an interesting idea, but you're definitely not going to be the host. We're going to have to hire a model or an actress. Every single person would say that to me. And I was like, well, fuck that. Like, I'm not doing this so that someone else can go and travel the world and have an amazing time. I know I can do this. Granted, I've never been on camera. So I kept hitting that same roadblock of, sorry, you know, you might get creator credit. You're just going to have to sell this off. And I doubt it's going to see the light of day, but good luck to you. And so at some point, I think it was April or May, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do this myself. I have friends who went to film school at NYU. I'm sure I could find like friends that I could hire. And you know what? Every year in my family's hometown, I have such a strong connection back to my roots. They have this big wheat harvest festival where they dress up and they have, there's a, a folkloric dance group and half of the town's last name is Malazi too. So I, I'm related to half of the people there. I can speak the language and my grandmother lives there and we can stay in my grandmother's little farmhouse and she'd be able to cook for us so we could save some money on food. I mean, we, I was bootstrapping this whole thing and I spent my life savings on it, which wasn't a lot, but you know, it was money. And so we did it. So I hired a group of three friends. I didn't know what I was doing and they were wonderful. And it was this adventure. I was trying to figure out how to put together a story. I didn't know anything about pre-production but I was getting all the interviews and, and putting all these things together, getting a, a schedule together. And again, harping back to having that experience in the music industry, I used to do that. You know, I'd, I'd like set up interviews for PR for our clients because I was in management. I would do all the marketing. I was like in every aspect of the industry for management for our artists. So I knew all this stuff. And the funny thing is we get there, we're flying over. I'll never forget my parents. I was flying out. Let me preface this by saying everyone thought I was crazy, rightfully so. Everyone thought I was completely nuts. My boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, thought I was completely nuts. My family thought I was nuts. 
But they were like, well, Michaela always has some crazy idea. So let's just go with it. Let's see her off and wish her luck. My grandmother, I was trying to explain to her, like, we're going to have this show where I'm going to dance. And she just didn't get it. And it was really hard to explain to people what I was trying to do, even the group in Italy, because now I can say, here, watch our episodes. And this is what the show is. Before, there was nothing to set as an example. There wasn't even anything anyone else had done to set as an example, right? It was like, you have to trust me. I think I know what I, how I want to see this. So we were there for a week. I was there for a week before everybody, uh, like my friends came so that I could meet with all the people, make sure that they understood I had to jump in with them and dance with them. They came and my grandmother was so wonderful. She would cook for all of us every morning and afternoon. And we did some interviews with her. We cook with her in the episode. But what's so funny is I prepped all this stuff and then it was time for me to be on camera. And I forgot that I had to be on camera. Like I completely forgot that that was part of the show, that Michaela is a host or I'm going to be a host. So the first time I had to be in front of the camera, I froze And I was like, Bridget, a wonderful director, her name is Bridget Savage Cole. She was my DP for that shoot. And I was like, Bridget, I don't know what to say. And she's like, girl, you're just talking to me. It's me, Bridget, behind the camera. Because I looked at that lens and I saw this black hole, this black abyss of nothingness. And I was like, oh my God, I'm speaking to an inanimate object. I don't know what I'm doing. This is so weird. What if I'm failing? Like, this is, I'm not supposed to do this. I had this like total panic. And she's like, no, you're just talking to me. This is cool. Like, So from that moment on, every time I looked at a lens, I would imagine Bridget was behind it. I was talking to her. Like it really changed my mindset of of how to talk to the camera. And we did it. We had this amazing experience. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. They left and I stayed with my grandmother for another week. And I was like teaching dance classes to help pay for the shoot. I was still a full-time dance teacher. And I had hooked up with a dance studio in Italy, 20 minutes away from my grandmother, because I was like paying for all this myself came back to the US, we put together a sizzle reel, started pitching it again to third party production companies, because again, we wanted I wanted it to be on Travel Channel. And I signed with this third party production company was these two dudes from New York. And I should have known better because their company was called No Regrets Entertainment. (laughs) (laughs) First red flag, right? So I sign an exclusive shopping agreement, which means in terms of television, it means they're going to have exclusivity to be able to shop it around to networks. And I, because I didn't know any better, signed a year's shopping agreement, exclusive shopping agreement. And normal terms is anywhere from 30 to 90 days. I didn't know that. So I sign 365 days and hand over this footage to them, these hard drives that I paid for myself. They didn't give me any money. It was like, okay, we're going to put together a sizzle and we're going to shop it. And we have a great relationship with Travel Channel and great. And then two weeks later, we find out Travel Channel signed an identical show called Dance Around the World, hosted by this gorgeous former ballroom, competitive ballroom dancer. And we found out. And so I was like, oh my gosh, someone is doing my show and it's on Travel Channel. So I go back to the production company. I said, okay, so who are we going to pitch it to now? And they're like, oh, we're not pitching it to anybody. It's done. The show is already made. Like, good luck. And I was like, well, I want my footage back. And they're like, well, since you signed a year's exclusive shopping agreement with us, you can either buy it back for $30,000 or wait your year's agreement out. When, every time I'd say that story, I always think, and I'm thinking this right now, like, how the hell did I keep going after that? <laughs> because those are like two pretty big things. I had no access to my footage. And there was already another show that was going to come out much better than mine, right? With a budget and like a gorgeous host and distribution on a, a network. I mean, at that moment, I should have just been like, all right, I'm done. I'm going to go back to finding a real job. Like this is just a pipe dream. And I don't know what was going on in my mind, but I didn't do that. Thank God. And I said, I'm going to have to wait out my year's licensing agreement. And I told myself, I was like, I'm not doing this to be on TV. I'm doing this because I truly believe in the power of these stories through dance and music. So you know what? I'm going to start a blog. And I started writing and I started building this craft of telling stories through dance and and living in New York. Every single night I would go out 
and take dance classes or go to like see dance performances. I would go to the flamenco festival in New York city. I would go, I mean, anything you could think of, I would do, and I would write about it. And I, for over a year until I got my footage back, that was probably the best time because I was like honing the craft of telling stories of dance, right? Not just making these funny videos. It was really the craft of telling stories and what does it mean to me and why am I doing this? And fast forward, started making YouTube videos. I would shoot myself. I would film myself. I'd go on, you know, I'd teach abroad for the summers because I would teach at dance studios in New York City. But in the summers, I teach in Italy and then in Europe, kind of bop around or I'd go to Buenos Aires. I'd go to all these places and I would teach so that I could fund these trips. And then I would create videos. And then eventually I hired an editor to create uh, short videos for YouTube of my Minturno episode. And then I started to gain traction and I got some sponsorship, worked with a company to do some videos in Buenos Aires and did a, a set of YouTube videos there. And slowly but surely never gave up on the TV idea. By the way, that show aired once, poor thing, on Travel Channel and was canceled. It was canceled after it aired one time. I think I've heard the rumor that it's still in litigation, that the producers can't touch it because Travel Channel owns it. And they've shot, I think, more than one episode. So over the years of building and building a social media following and building videos and really immersing myself in the travel industry, because I came from the dance background. So I went to every single travel conference. I'd go to Travel Massives, which was like a, a monthly meetup in New York City. I was networking and just meeting all these wonderful people in the industry and putting my face in front of everyone and asking people and really meeting with videographers and bloggers. And that's when like YouTube started to build up. And so I'm very well immersed into the the travel industry. I go to the New York Times travel show every year. Every year I see the same people at the expo and they're like, oh, Michaela. Because I the first year I went, I said, hey, I'm a dance teacher. I'd love to come to your destination and tell stories about dance. They're like, okay, good luck, right? Then the following year, hey, I have a blog and I'm writing about dance. I'm like, oh, good for you. Okay, we'll see you next year. Then it's a YouTube channel. Then all of a sudden it becomes a TV show. And when I tell you that the people in the travel industry saw me grow up, they literally saw me grow up. And I can't tell you how many people in the industry have worked with me because they're like, Mikkel, you stuck with it. We have seen people come and go, but we've seen you grow into this incredible series. And I still remember when you came up to my booth with your dance card. Like There are a countless number of people in the travel industry that, that still remember when I was just like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm this dance teacher that wants to come to Barbados and do a crop over, you know, like it's this wonderful community. Anyway, how we got to public television, how we got to PBS is sort of this crazy story. They're all crazy stories, but I think this is a testament. Also, you have to really put yourself out there and be vulnerable. So I think this was about 2012, 2013. So a few years into just like still trying to pitch for some sort of support for network. I want this to be on TV. I've put out already bare feet of Minturno, my, my first episode that you know now as like five minute videos on YouTube. I've already put the Buenos Aires episode on YouTube, but like these five minute videos and building all these little videos on YouTube. And I get a call from a friend of mine who worked at a, a PR firm for, for tourism boards. And she goes, Hey, Michaela, we just got a pitch from this show on PBS and it sounds really familiar to yours. And I read it and it was a show. I mean, now we're friends, but it was the same premise, traveling the world through dance and music. And I devastated again. I was like crying. I called my sister. I was just like, Oh my gosh, PBS signed a same show as mine again. Like this happened to me again. Little did I know that PBS doesn't sign shows. They're all independent producers, but I didn't know that at the time. So you know, as we do, we follow people who are maybe our competitors. And, and so every once in a while, I'd follow this girl on social media and see what she was up to. And I didn't want it to drive me crazy. So I like, I didn't officially follow her, but I check in every once in a while. So I'm sitting in my sister's apartment in Boston. She lives in Boston. This was in November, 2013. And I'm sitting in Boston. And I was like, you know, what? let me just check that account and see what this girl's up to, you know, when this show's coming out. And she had a picture of a wing of an airplane saying, I'm heading to Boston to present my show to PBS programmers. Wish me luck. And I was like, to my sister, I said, Adriana, I have to go there. I don't know what this is. I don't know what she's talking about, but I'm in Boston. Like, what are the odds? I'm sitting in Boston. So for like the next six hours, I was searching and searching, couldn't figure out what this girl was talking about. Couldn't find anything about PBS. Couldn't find anything. Next morning, I'm like calling 
any of the PBS affiliate contacts that I have because I had done press trips where someone's like, oh, I'm a local PBS news anchor in Florida or something. Nobody ever heard of any of this conference. Eventually, I find out that it's it's called American Public Television's Fall Marketplace. It's a distributor of PBS and public television programming. So public television is nothing like network or cable. You don't get a check from PBS. As an independent producer, you have to find all your funding, you have to pay for distribution, and you have to pay for your production based on the brought to you in part by Viking River Cruises or whomever you have. That's what helps create the show. And I didn't know that at the time. In my head, I'm thinking PBS signed this girl. So American Public Television is one of their distributors of public television content. So they apparently they have this annual fall marketplace. And I finally find the information. It's like, you know, a 10 minute T ride, the train in in Boston away from my sister's apartment. And I was like, I'm just going to go, I'm going to show up. And it was like, tickets are $450 for the day. And I didn't have $450 for the day. Uh, But they were like, there was this little, little asterisk that said, um, if you are a guest of someone, it's only $35 for the day. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go. So I show up and I made up some name and I said, I'm a guest of, I don't remember some PBS station in God knows where. And they said, sure, give us $35. Here's your name badge. And I was like, oh my God. So I walk in, (laughs) snuck into this conference, see the girl and her booth. And now I know what they're doing is they're presenting to local programmers from all over the United States. And as I'm going in there, there are other PBS hosts. The room is full of PBS programmers. And another host came up to me and said, who I had introduced myself to years before that at the New York Times Travel Show, his name is Joseph Rosendo. He's a a wonderful host of Travel Scope. And he came up to me, or I went up to him. I said, I said, Joseph, I don't know if you remember me. I I met you at the New York Times Travel Show. He goes, oh yeah, I remember you, Michaela. My, My wife and I love your work. And he goes, I want to introduce you to someone because she gave me my first break. And so he, he introduces me to the head of programming at this little station in New York City called NYC Life. And she's this beautiful woman. She's Puerto Rican. I said, oh, great. We have episodes in Puerto Rico. We didn't have episodes in Puerto Rico. We had filmed YouTube videos in Puerto Rico, right? So I meet her and she's like, oh, this sounds like an interesting show. Give me your card. We'll think about it. I said, oh, we do episodes in Puerto Rico. She's like, great. And then I leave. And a month later, she calls me. She goes, Michaela, we want 13 half hour episodes of your show. And I was like, great. She goes, we need them starting in a month. And I was like, okay. And I hang up the phone and realized I didn't have half, I didn't have a TV show. I had YouTube videos, but I figured it out. I figured out (laughs) how to make the show because they were giving me free airtime. Usually, if you're going to air on public television, you have to pay for that airtime. That's the brought to you in part buys. So I got my show in the number one market in the United States in New York City. Granted, she gave me like a crappy time slot. I don't know what time. It was like one in the morning or something. And then I had submitted for a regional Emmy and I got two nominations. I didn't tell anybody I submitted and I got a win for best host, by the way, which in retrospect, you know, all those producers that said, you're not going to be the host, we're going to have to hire a a model or an actress. And I won two Emmys for best host actually, but I won then. And the station was like, we're going to put you in primetime. We want more episodes. I still didn't have funding. I still didn't figure out how I was going to, you know, I was getting local funding here and there. And when I would do a trip with, I would barter with friends to film with me I would hire my friends who were other travel vloggers. So we would kind of like help each other out. I would get some support from local tourism boards, but it was scrapping it together. When I'd say it was scrappy, our first, our entire first and second season were shot with just me and one other person. That's it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) I'm the sound person I may do. So that was 2014 when the show premiered on local NYC Life. They are my family. They are my presenting station. I can't live without them. They're fantastic. And without them, I wouldn't be where I am today. And then in 2016, I thought, let me get the top 13 episodes of my series. I want to take these nationally. And so I was able to get a a bigger sponsor, an underwriter, and we put them out on national. 
And then at that same time, I worked with the local NYC Life Station because I said, look, we could travel the world within the five boroughs without using a passport. We could just use our Metro card. How can we make that into a series? And they said, well, we can help support that since it's a local story. So the whole second season is a co-production with NYC Life. It's literally traveling the world within the five boroughs of New York City. And we took that nationally. And then season three was traveling through my roots. I knew I was Italian. I can trace my roots back for generations to that one town in Minturno, Italy. And I thought, why not really highlight other aspects of my ancestry that I don't know? So I got a DNA test before DNA travel even became a thing and started on this journey. And DNA travel became a top travel trend in 2019. And we got a ton of press, New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Connie Nast Traveler, a whole bunch of stuff. And that's sort of how it happened. But I own all of my content. I own everything. I am the executive producer. I am the host. I know every aspect of my business because I had to learn every aspect of my show, of this process, because there was no one there who was going to do it for me, right? That's the... <laughs> so <laughs> that's amazing. The story. It's so amazing. And I'm such a fan of the show. I want to go a little bit deeper into this now and, and talk about some yeah. of the specific episodes and maybe yeah. get some behind the scenes uh, from you on some of these experiences. Oh, so I'm just going to tell you the way that I approached watching your series, which yeah. actually I would recommend for my audience to approach it the same way too. I didn't go chronologically great, uh, because they're all self-contained episodes. So you don't need to watch them in, in chronologically per se. So what I did is I picked out episodes so it's either of places that I have spent time, mm -hmm. which I'm familiar with and I really like, and I wanted to see how you engaged with that particular city or region, or I picked places that I have never been that mm -hmm. are on my bucket list that I really want to go. And I wanted to see through your eyes, you know, your experiences of a place that I've never been. Mm -hmm. um, and I just picked out some of the ones and I just kind of like went in that order about the ones that were most interesting to me. So for episode one, I did watch the first episode, of course, right? Oh, thank you. It is important to watch episode one of season one because that sort of sets the whole context. And that's, of course, the one you just told the story about where you're going back and visiting your family in Italy. And it's really important, I think, to start with that one. But beyond that, yeah. I then started kind of cherry picking them. And Argentina is a place where I have spent probably about five months. Mm -hmm. I lived in uh, Buenos Aires for about four of those five months. So I was super excited. I mean, I love the city, of course, right? Yeah. And was yeah. super excited to see how you engaged in that city with tango and everything. And I was completely blown away because I knew all of the places that you were going, right? I was like, oh, I've been there, yeah. I've been there, I've been there. <laughs> and then you're doing the, you go to the outside, the outdoor, you know, tango thing. I've been, been there and all this. And then, of course, I have seen a show at Tango Porteño, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is like the preeminent theater for professional tango production in Buenos Aires. And it's like the thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah. And then my mind is blown as I'm watching you <laughs> land in Buenos Aires. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I haven't really danced tango before. I'm just here. I've been here for a week. And you're like learning tango and you're dancing, starting dancing with these locals and picking it up. And then literally you're like, yeah, I've been dancing tango for one week and I'm getting an opportunity to perform on stage in front of a full theater as mm -hmm. part of the professional production at Tango Portenia. And I was like, what? Yeah. I know yeah. how unbelievable that show is and how talented those people are that perform there. And there's you with a week of Tango experience performing in the show. My mind was completely blown. So I would love for you to just share a little bit about, you know, any sort of behind the scenes yeah. of how all that came about and how Buenos Aires was for you. Oh my gosh. As you're saying that, like I, I get a little anxious thinking back because that, that was probably the scariest moment of my life. I know that it's not horror. It was definitely a shift in my life. And I'll tell you why. So first of all, Buenos Aires, that was the second time I'd been there. The first time I went was with friends. We stayed in a hostel and just fell in love with the city. And so the second time was that trip. And I've been there again since we had a barefoot tour that went and I brought some travelers with me to do this whole dance experience that I love to do. But Buenos Aires is a special, special place. And wow, that was the second episode I ever filmed. So that was like the second time I'd ever been in front of the camera as well. 
but I was with dear friends. We had, that was actually one of the few shoots from season one or two where we had a, a videographer, but we actually had a sound person because she was shooting on a DSLR. So the sound was not in the camera. So I was with people who love me and who I love, and I felt comfortable with them. And that's the thing that I really made a point to do because I wasn't a trained journalist or actress. And so me being in front of the camera, I was very self-conscious about it, but I was surrounded by people who believed in what I was doing and just were, we were there to have an incredible experience. The dancing was wonderful. So all the people that I met, especially Ines Rosetti, which she is, I call her my tango angel. I was connected with her through a friend of a friend of a friend, right? I didn't really have any contacts there. And I somehow got in touch with her through a filmmaker. And she is this beautiful, lovely dancer who is so well connected in Buenos Aires. And that's how we were able to go to one of her rehearsals because she was a, a student, a dance student at the university. We went to La Zona Tango with her because she was a teacher there. But she has this aura of, about her of this calmness. And it was just so beautiful. And we, and we were then able to meet with the young people of Buenos Aires who were sort of this up and coming group from Caminito, you know, so, so we go into their home. It was just this beautiful sense of, I'm not a tourist. And that's our goal is not to just be a tourist. It's to really connect with the locals, to connect with the people of the place that we're going to. And that's always been the mission of Bare Feet. But I think right off the bat, we were able to do that because I genuinely wanted to do that. And that's how I genuinely travel myself. So taking some tango lessons, doing the shoots, it was wonderful, beautiful. And what I love about our shoots too, is my crew, every time we would do a shoot, my crew, whoever was with me would be like, wow, this is, we're really lucky to be here right now because we're in these moments that you usually don't get to be with a film crew. Um, because we we have such a small footprint with our cameras of either just one camera or two small cameras, we're able to maneuver into these really small spaces. As you know, La Zona Tango inside is tiny. It's tiny. And some of these places are just super intimate. And so that's the beauty of not having a big crew is, is being able to, to be in those moments, being fully present, but also having our subjects, the people that we're filming, feel comfortable with us too, because they're not always used to being on camera. Most of the people that we film may not be professional dancers. They're just dancers. They, they, they love dance. And so we want to make them feel as comfortable as possible so they can share their vulnerability with us. That's amazing. We get to Tango Porteño. I knew I was going to be in the show, but I thought I was going to be like an extra or a, a, you know, like a, a background dancer. Honestly, I was like, okay, we're going to be a background dancer. No big deal. We show up. It's this beautiful theater. The producer is such a character. He's such a character. And he's like, oh, Michaela, you're going to be a featured dancer. And I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't know how to tango. Like I just learned how to tango. He's like, oh no, no, you're going to have a little half hour rehearsal with the choreographer of the show, Jesus. And I was like, oh my God, this poor choreographer. Like I am not a professional tango dancer. He was so patient with me. But when I tell you, when I was so nervous and you could see my hands shaking a little bit and I start to kind of lose it backstage because then it became really real. I was like, oh my gosh, I, there are people that are paying to see this show. You know, I'm going to be up there and I, it's going to be dis a disappointment because they're paying to come and see professional tango dancers. They're going to see me, you know, I mean, I wasn't the whole show. It was just like a two minute performance, but still in my head, I'm like, this is, I can't do this. I cannot do this. They're getting me dressed up. By the way, the dress was like basically naked lace. You know, it's like <laughs> be as vulnerable as possible, Mikel. Like this is it. And it was so nerve wracking. And they're doing my hair. Even the dancers in the show, when I was explaining what I was doing, because they saw me and they're like, you're crazy. You're crazy. I can't believe you're doing this. You're nuts. And so I was so nervous. We're backstage, me and Jesus. And he gives me a hug and I'm like trying to calm myself down. So I'm not shaking. And granted, this is the second time I've ever filmed any bare feet stuff whatsoever. So Bridget, my girl, Bridget's in the audience filming with the big camera and my sound guy, Mike is on the side of the stage. So I'm on stage. He's standing on stage left. For those of you, if you're facing, looking at the stage, he's on the right side holding one of those flip videos. Remember those little flip videos that people used to have? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like janky little thing. 
I was going to enter from the opposite end of the stage and then exit where he is. And the whole goal was to get on that flip video, my reaction, which he did of like, we did it, you know? So I say goodbye to the little flip video and I go to the other end of the stage shaking. I mean, my hands are shaking. My, my legs are shaking. I'm so nervous. I'm basically crying just because of nerves. And I sit down for a second in the wings watching these beautiful dancers. And I thought to myself, Kella, what is wrong with you? This is your dream. This is exactly what you wanted. This is exactly what you wanted. You dreamt of this. Literally, you dreamt of this, of jumping in with a professional tango show on stage and you have a film crew and you're making a TV show. Snap out of it. Like, what, what the fuck is wrong with you? I was literally giving myself a pep talk and I had this huge smile on my face. And I was like, yeah, this is my dream. It's my dream come true. And I got on stage and I felt fucking fantastic. And I did it. It wasn't perfect. And then I walked off stage and felt like a million bucks. And then you see my reaction. Like it, that's all from the flip video when the producer and everyone backstage is like, oh my gosh, one day you're going to tell your grandchildren, you know, you danced on a stage. And I have never been nervous ever again since that moment. Because you know why? I am living my dream. This is what I wanted. And there's no reason for me to be upset because who gets to say that? Who gets to say they're literally living their dream out? And if I screw up, it doesn't matter. That, that shows that I'm a real person. If I screw up, it could be funny. If I screw up, it could be joyous. If I get it, it could be funny and joyous. Like there is no reason to be upset. And, and I, that was this pivotal moment for me emotionally, but also like as the host of like, wow, Michaela, you are the luckiest person in the world to have convinced these people to let you do this. <laughs> And it changed my life. That moment changed my life. Well, it was amazing. You killed the performance. Anybody can go to the show and watch it. I mean, you crushed it. And then you got roaring applause from the full audience at the theater as soon as you were done. So it was amazing. Thank and you. I was just blown away, you know, as I am in a lot of your episodes, by the speed with which you can walk into a brand new cultural situation and learn a dance that these people have been dancing their whole life. You're just jumping into it now. And within a very short period of time, like a week or so, you are able to get to a very impressive level in terms of being able to perform all these different dances. And people can see that as they go through your different episodes and see how different a lot of the types of cultural dances are that you do. So it's amazing. That's an amazing episode. So I would recommend people watch Thank episode you. one and two, Thank you know, to you. start off with and then just go from there because it's awesome. Thank you. I do also want to talk now about episode, season two because yeah. Yeah. we started off in the beginning talking about our shared love for New York, which largely centers on the fact that it is the entire planet of Earth yeah. condensed into one city and you yeah. have these really cohesive, large ethnic enclaves, right, mm -hmm. that have mm -hmm. this incredible cultural preservation of their dances and food and culture and everything else and it's all there in New York and the fact that you spent an entire season mm -hmm. exploring that, I really, really love. And I want to ask if you can just talk a little bit about some of your experiences in that season. One of the episodes that I really particularly loved was the episode about the Indian community mm -hmm. in New York City, because Bhangra is one of my favorite types of music yes. in the entire world. Yes. In the world. It Love is, it. right? And I've actually been to Punjab, where oh, wow. Bhangra music comes from. Yeah, I actually spent uh, Diwali in <gasps> Amritsar in Punjab. Oh my gosh, that's like a dream of mine. That is a dream oh. of mine. Yeah, it was so amazing. And, you know, for people that don't know, the state of Punjab was divided in 1948 when uh, India and Pakistan were partitioned. And the border of India and Pakistan literally runs right through the middle of the state of Punjab. So the yeah. Punjabis are, there's the Indian side and then there's the Pakistani side. And I was actually... In 2020, I was supposed to go to Lahore in Pakistan for probably wow. about a month and see the Pakistani side of Punjab. But of course, COVID happened. So that's still on the travel list. But I'm a huge fan of Bhangra music, which also a lot of it actually developed in the diaspora, right? Like the Punjabi diaspora is where a lot of that music comes from as well. It's so funny that you bring that up because... That's how I got dancing again. The woman that we start off in that whole episode, Serena Jane, she has a, a workout called uh, Masala Bhangra. 
I love that woman to death because she got me dancing again. I had been working in the music industry, was getting burnt out, and I had stopped dancing for a really, really long time, like a number of years. And I was like, you know what? I got to go to the gym. I got to like start working out. I hate treadmills. I hate going to the gym. It's the worst. It's the absolute worst. (laughs) But I joined Crunch Gym in Astor Place. And every, what was it? Monday night, Tuesday night, I would work out. And then I would go downstairs and there was this, to go to the locker room. And there was this dance studio. And there were like 50 people dancing in unison to this amazing music and this beautiful Indian woman. She looked like a witch. She has like hair down to here. And she's this gorgeous woman who's just like so much energy. And it turns out to be Serena Jane. And she did Masala Bhangra. And I just fell in love and eventually became a teacher of hers and performed with her and decided to quit my music industry gig and become a dance teacher. I mean, because of her really. So I owe a lot to that woman and we're very, very dear friends. And so that was a really special episode because she was in it. What I want people to realize is most of the people you see in that entire season are my friends. What was beautiful is creating bare feet. I did two full seasons of international, mostly international destinations on NYC life. Some were really bad episodes that I had put together from my YouTube videos of me filming myself. And again, I took the top 13 out of those 23 episodes and made a season one nationally to air on nationally on PBS. But when I was creating all of this, I was building my blog. I was still dancing with people in New York City. So everybody knew that I had this project. All of my dancer friends, all of the Kalpuli Mexican dance, Serena, Puja, all these wonderful people that I had danced with on a regular basis. All of a sudden, when I went to NYC Life and pitched them this idea of like, why don't we bring bare feet just to New York City? And they loved it. I was like, I know everybody who I need to to feature. And all I had to do was pick up my phone and call all of my friends that were in New York because I couldn't feature them before because it wasn't an international destination. And now we had a reason to show all these beautiful people that I love. So pretty much almost every single person you see in that season are people that I love, people that know me, people that support me, that I've danced with before, that I've either traveled with before. So it was, or that if someone was connected in the episode, then reconnected me with someone else. So it was just really, I love that season so much because again, like I said before, that's how I see New York City, but it's also my friends, my family. These are people I love. We were actually supposed to do another season of Bare Feet in NYC, COVID hit, you know, we, <laughs> we were supposed to do, there's plenty more, there's plenty more to do. But that episode I love, we, we, we celebrate Diwali as well. We did Garba in the city, which is at Chelsea Piers. I dance with Serena. We do Bollywood dance. I do Bartanatium with a, a beautiful group called Alokam. We go to Jackson Heights and get to eat all the, the beautiful food and ladu and, and all this one. It's just wonderful. So again, to me, that's New York that is New York. And and that's just one snippet. Uh, and we do 13 episodes. And I loved making those seasons. My videographer and I, her name's Lina Plioplite. She and I, we just love making the show together. And she's also filming with me in season three. But she's so funny. Like I put together, the, I'm doing all the pre-production. I'm setting up all the interviews. So like morning we have a shoot. She's like, okay, today we're doing Mexico. And then in the afternoon, we're going to do India. And then tonight we're going to do Ukraine. Like it was literally every day we'd be traveling to different quote unquote parts of the world for a few hours. And it was this wonderful example of how culturally diverse New York City really is. Yeah. And I also loved about that season two in New York City that you showcased different sections of the city. So Mm -hmm. you were showcasing different ethnic groups and immigrant communities and all of that, but you were also showcasing different parts of the city and going through the history Mm -hmm. of Harlem or the South Bronx or Jackson Heights in Queens or this part of Brooklyn. And you were kind of going through the whole history and where this music and dance came from and the immigrant history and all that kind of stuff. So it was just a really beautiful ode to New York City, I think, season two. I mean, it's just really amazing. And I've just, I mean, if you love New York City, you're just going to be in love with season two. And if you don't know much about New York City, you're just going to learn so much because it was just really, really spectacular. But I thought it was a very special season. And I also now, though, want to ask you about season three, because I will tell you, you're back out in the world and you're doing the DNA trip and going to all these different places where you have some level of DNA heritage, which took you to a lot of different places in the world. 
Now, the first thing I noticed about season three, I have to say, is the videography was just next level. Thank like, you. I well, mean, we had two it was cameras. Crazy. <laughs> we doubled. We doubled our crew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you're doing like aerial shots of these cities that are just like blowing my mind and the way the architecture and stuff. I mean, it was just like the visual aesthetic, I think, of season three just like hit me in a way that I was just like, wow, like this is really an amazing sort of, you know, showcase of the beauty of these places. And you really had that huge focus. I mean, you still had, of course, all of the wonderful things from, you know, season one and season two in terms of you and the dance and the connection with the communities and the history and the food and all of that. But in addition, I think you just really stepped up, you know, the visual aesthetic, which, you know, uh, creates an additional sort of level of, you know, emotional connection for me anyways with those places. I mean, it was amazing. Thank you. And that's all is contributed by the incredibly talented people that I work with. Uh, my main crew are Lina Plioplite and Evan Carter. They're just like the dynamic duo. And I have some other fantastic crew. I work with a, a company called Little Dragon and also a, a wonderful filmmaker named uh, Juliana Brasti and Marco Alonso. And it's sort of who's available in this shoot, at this time, in, in this destination. Um, but it really is, you know, it's an honor to be able to be in these wonderful places with people who I consider not just people I work with, but they're like family. We, you, you spend an incredible amount of time together and very intense experiences, right, emotionally, because you're just having these, we're shooting like 14-hour days. So it's tiresome exhausting, but also so incredibly beautiful and dynamic and memorable. And like going to some of these places where we're brought into people's homes and we become part of their families. So we share that experience as a collective together as a group. I'm grateful that I've built such wonderful friendships with the people that I get to work with. Because again, if I don't feel comfortable with the people I'm shooting with, you're going to see it on camera. I am not a good actress. I'm a terrible actress. So I, I feel very grateful to have them in my life. So let me ask you about a couple of your experiences. And as I said, the way that I sort of went through the episodes, I was sort of cherry picking other places that I've been that I want to see you experience or yeah. places I've never been that I want to learn from you about. And one of the places that I've never been that's really, really been high on my list for quite some time that you went in season three mm -hmm. is to Uzbekistan. Oh, yeah. And it was just, I mean, amazing. The architecture and the way that you sort of showed the country was just fantastic. But I'd love to hear from you, especially since, you know, that was part of your DNA. How was Uzbekistan for you? It was actually the second time I had been to Uzbekistan because the dance is so incredible. The music is so incredible. The architecture is just stunning. You'll never see anything else like it. Like in Samarkand, it's just Registan Square is breathtaking. And to know that this was a place of learning, this was a place where scholars lived and shared brilliant ideas at, of the time, you know, of science and mathematics and astronomy and, and all of these things, it, it's really was this focal point at the time in the world of thinking. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. The food is incredible. And it was so much fun. Again, I pinch myself every time like, wow, we get to do this. And I somehow convinced all these people to let me do these crazy things with them. And when we were in Bukhara, speaking of like convincing people to do crazy things, every shoot we're on, there's like lost in translation. We get to Bukhara. That's the very last segment where I'm in that beautiful green dress. And they didn't understand that I was supposed to dress up and dance with them. They just thought we were going to sit in the audience and watch these beautiful dancers dance. And that's never the case. It's always, we need to dance with them. So it was a show that they do. And there's an earlier evening show and a later evening show. And so they literally let me jump in with them in between shows while they're like ushering out the people from the last dinner and about to open the doors to let the other tourists come in to sit down for the dinner. So I only had 15 minutes to get dressed up. And that poor woman, Lilia, that's why she's like, I had panic on my face. She says that I, I had panic because she's like, how am I supposed to teach this girl something in, in 10, 15 minutes? But it always works out. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> it always works out. And she looked just like my mother's side of the family. She looks just like my mom. She looks like just like all my mom's female cousins, all of them. And it was uncanny because here we are on this like sort of DNA adventure and I'm dancing with this wonderful woman who looks like my mother. 
It's great. I remember you telling her that in the episode and her giving you a hug and that moment. That was really nice. Yeah. I want to also ask you about one of the episodes I thought was most powerful in season three was when you went to Morocco, which is an amazing country. I've been to Morocco multiple times. And one of the things about that episode that I want to ask you about is, you know, a lot of times I'm watching your show and you're very happy and laughing with people and connecting with locals. And you can just see you're in your element and you're passionate and you're just totally enthused in all of this. And in Morocco, that was also the case. But in addition to that, there were about three times in this 30 minute episode where you became emotionally overwhelmed and actually broke down crying. And I want to ask if you can just talk a little bit about what was so powerful for you about Morocco. Yeah. So, yeah, there were three cries, three big cries. And what's so funny is my Lina, my DP, was like, Michaela, you're crying too much on this trip. <laughs> like, I couldn't help it. I was so emotional on that trip. There were a few things happening. So I had just lost my uncle maybe a few months before who I dedicated the entire series to, my Zio Tony. I had just lost him a few months before we were on that shoot. And so I was very, very close to him and his family. And when we got to Morocco, just being emotionally sort of raw, right? Just because of that, I was sort of in that my, in that state. And we met with Dad Ganawa, which was the Ganawa group. That's the first one you see in the episode. And something happened to me in that moment. And I, I honestly can't explain it. I felt this connection to the place, but the people who I was dancing with, I felt this openness. And I, I'm not saying I went into a trance, but I felt some sort of connection to that place, like a very, very, very strong and deep emotional connection. And it hit me sort of like a wave. I felt this emotion like a wave. And that's the ugly cry that you see at the very beginning. I mean, it literally is. I don't even remember seeing the camera. I don't really remember. I just remember Muhammad like embracing me. And all I remember is that is of just this like warmth and kindness. And I really can't tell you why it happened. Looking back, Ganawa music is about the people who've been oppressed in Morocco. And I think having empathy for people and their situations, but also of like ancestors. I don't know. I felt this strong connection to them and their mission through the dance, through the music, through the movement, the fact that they just let me in and took me in and let me do this. It was like a guttural reaction. And again, I really don't know how to explain how that, what happened at that moment, but it was just a very raw moment that naturally came out. And again, I remember Muhammad just like embracing me. Right. So I had cried my eyes out that afternoon. And later that evening, we go to Cafe Tarab, which is just this little cafe where we're going to go hear some Tarab music, which is like Arabic music, you know, folk music. And this tiny little cafe. And, and you know, we walk in and this man looks like my father and my grandfather and my uncle. And I lost it because I had just lost my uncle. I'm going to start crying again. I mean, there was this very strong presence of him throughout the whole trip. And Lina, who was my DP, she knows my family. She is family to me. And she's like, oh my God, he does look like your dad. He does look like your family. So it was just this like, holy shit, this is real. And that was the second cry was because I felt like I was looking at my family members living in front of me. And then the third cry, all of the times we plan for our story that we're going to tell, who we're going to meet, how we're going to meet them, all these things. But sometimes, actually a lot of times while we're on the shoots, sort of these serendipitous things happen that are organized while we're on the ground, while we're there, because the people that we're with, whether it's the tourism board or our guide, realize how genuine we really, I think that's what it is. I think they see like, wow, Michaela really cares about our culture. And it's not just some travel show about hotels and restaurants and best spas to go to. Like she really cares about our culture and the people. And they always are like, you know what, would you want to meet this person or this person? And so it turns out that our guide Wafa, who, who we introduced at um, Shafshaw in the blue city, she married into the Amadzik people, the Berber tribe. 
And she goes, you know, Michaela, my mother-in-law is this beautiful woman. She wants to cook for you. But we also have the band, the Berber tribe band that played at our wedding. We just got married less than a year ago. Would you be interested in coming to this ceremony that would be the band? And I was like, oh my God, yes, of course. Like, And this is all happening when we got to Tangier, right? So it was like, okay, in a few days, we're going to set it up and it's going to happen. So it's like all these magical moments kind of evolve as we're on the ground. So we meet with Mama. I like to just call her Mama because she's amazing. And she dressed me up in a traditional outfit, like a pearl. And then we go up the mountain right outside of Fez. And there's this Berber tribe, the Amadzik people set up a beautiful tent. It's all rocky, mountainous, beautiful. And they are making music and they're playing these hand drums and they're singing. And again, my crew and I were just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is... And again, I'm thinking to myself, how did I convince these people to let me do this? This is real. This is... Bare feet is real. Bare feet is, again, a dream come true. So we get there I'm pinching myself. We start filming and they just keep singing. So the songs that they're singing, it's led by that beautiful maestro who's shaking his shoulders. He's wearing this green cape. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. And I'm just following along. Sometimes I jump in with the dancers. Sometimes he gave me a drum at some point to follow him. Granted, an hour passes by. Like they are singing and dancing for an hour. It's like these rolling songs where it's like call and response and then there's a lull and then they pick up again and then there's a lull and then they pick up again. So my crew, we're getting all these shots and, and finally they're like, I think we got enough because it's physically hard to be running around that space and getting the shots. So we're like, I think we got it. So we're about to cut and Wafa comes running up to me because then they start singing again, right? We thought the song was over and then they start singing. And Wafa comes up to me and I was about to be like, oh, no, no, I think we're done. And she goes, Mikella, they're singing your name. They're saying, Mikella, you are welcome. Mikella, you are welcome. And again, I lost it. I just start crying. Again, I don't see the cameras. I don't, all I am doing is looking at the singers who also still look a lot like my family <laughs> <laughs> who are singing to me with this hospitality of bringing them into their culture, into their homes, into their space. And I'm thinking to myself, this is real. This is real. This is my life. Bare feet's real. How did this happen? I mean, that's what was going on in my mind at that moment was like, I cannot believe that I get to do this. This is my job. And I'm in a Berber tent outside of Fez in the mountains being sung to by these incredibly hot, warm and welcoming people. And I'm dancing with them and I couldn't hold it in. And so those are the three. <laughs> so amazing. Three moments. And there's something about Morocco. I felt really, the second I stepped foot off that plane, I felt like something's happening here. I don't know what it was, but I, I felt so connected there. Yeah, it's a really special place. And I, I thought you encapsulated it so well in that Thank episode. You. Just awesome. So yeah. I now want to ask you about season four, which I understand has just been released. Yes. Can you tell us about that and what we can expect? Yes. Oh my gosh. Season four. So I feel incredibly lucky that we even have these episodes coming out. We were supposed to start shooting a full season four last May. But obviously, COVID hit. Everything's been put on hold indefinitely. But luckily, we were sitting on this footage that we shot featuring Carnival in the Guadalupe Islands, which if you've ever been to the Guadalupe Islands, it's amazing. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Pristine beaches, all that fun stuff. But what's even more special about it, and I think that's what I love about our show, is we really focus on the people and the culture. So I had this opportunity, Lynn and I filmed in the Guadalupe Islands uh, a few years ago, actually, and it didn't fit in our DNA season because my DNA just doesn't come from the Guadalupe Islands. So we're like, you know what, we're going to save it for season four. But we had that opportunity to film there and I didn't want to lose that opportunity to film Carnival. So we were supposed to come out with a whole 12 episode season for season four. It all got put on hold because of COVID. And... I was like, well, we're sitting on these, this beautiful footage. Maybe we can make two episodes out of it. And we have two gorgeous episodes featuring Carnival in the Guadalupe Islands, Black Joy, Black Culture. And when we shot this, this was pre-murder of George Floyd, pre-height of Black Lives Matter movement. 
And when I tell you there's a reason why these episodes are coming out now, I truly believe that because the interviews we did, we were meeting with cultural activist groups to fight for their Guadalupe identity, Black identity in the Guadalupe Islands. Guadalupe Islands is technically part of France. And we met with like these cultural activist groups of preserving the rhythms and the instruments, the language, the food, the culture so strongly. And for them to take me in and let me try them in itself was an honor. I mean, the to- we worked with the tourism board very closely to sort of help facilitate it. And even then they were like, I cannot believe Akio let you play with them. I cannot believe Mascacle let you do. I mean, because it is about preserving their culture and they let me in. And it was just the biggest honor. And I am so incredibly proud of these episodes. They're beautiful. Again, we want to highlight the stories of the local people and they share their stories so deeply. And what I love about these two episodes is we really got to dive deeply because we made two episodes instead of just one episode on the destination. We had so much beautiful content that I was like, let's do two. And and this is what we have. So it's our two-part special featuring Carnival in the Guadalupe Islands. I love them. The music is incredible. The dance is incredible. I love it. I just absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love it. That's amazing. And where can we watch this? I've been watching, I mean, just for context, I've been watching all of your series for free on Amazon Prime. They're available there. You don't have to rent them or anything. If you you know have Amazon Prime video, they're just available for free streaming. Will this be available there as well? Well, what I'm excited to announce is on the PBS app and pbs.org, all of our episodes are now available for free as well. So if you even don't have Amazon Prime, you can watch them on the PBS app or pbs.org. What I love about these episodes too is, you know, unfortunately this year, Carnival was canceled. A lot of celebrations were canceled because of COVID. And what I hope to bring to people is a reminder of what will come back, right? We have these celebrations of people coming together and making music and marching together. They will be back. But for this year that we don't have them in person, you can experience them vicariously through our show. And I'm really proud of that as well. Well, also speaking of coming back, you also run Barefeet Tours. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what a barefoot tour is, what people can experience if they go on one and what that will be like once it's safe to travel again? Yeah. So I started Barefeet Tours years ago because I thought I can't be the only one who's lucky enough to go around and, and, and travel through dance and music. Cause I had so many fans who was like, ah, oh, I would love to do what you're doing. And so we started barefoot tours a few years ago. Our first tour was to Bali, Indonesia. Then we did a barefoot tour in Buenos Aires, Argentina to do tango. And so recently I partnered with AAA travel. So going forward, all of our tours are going to be partner tours with them. And our next tours are going to Ireland. It's one of my favorite destinations in the world. I absolutely love Ireland. I've been like seven times. Every time I go back, I just fall more and more in love with that place. And if you ever watch our Ireland episodes, we have two episodes from season three. You're basically going to be get, get to do all of those things that we do, plus more. And you're going to get to meet all the amazing people that we get to dance with. You're going to uh, meet Anne-Marie Nelligan. We're going to dance with her, have a private lesson with her. We're going to be in Dingle, Ireland with Chef Beelan, who took us on a, a walking food tour. And I'll be there too. I'm going to be traveling with you. Our, our next tour is October. And then also in 2022, we're hoping that the tours run this year. Again, everything is up in the air in the sense of we're moving forward, that travel is going to happen this fall. But if it Uh, gets postponed, we'll push it to 2022 because safety is our our number one. But it really is traveling through the lens of dance and music. And you don't have to be a professional dancer. That's what I want people to understand is if you love to get up and dance at a wedding, right? Or if you love to just shake your butt, or if you are open to experiencing something new, this is the tour for you because we're not here to teach you how to be a member of river dance, right? That's not going to happen in a day. But if you can feel more connected to a place through its dances, through its music and Ireland, there is so much dance and music embedded in the culture. It's just a natural, natural trip 
that I've always wanted to put together. So I'm just so excited about it. And all of that information again is at travelbarefeet.com. If you all, everything's at (laughs) travelbarefeet.com. That's amazing. Well, I I appreciate that, especially because my heritage is primarily Irish. And Mm -hmm. I actually related very much to what you were talking about in the beginning, because I studied abroad in Ireland. I went Mm -hmm. to Trinity College in Dublin for a year during college, reconnected with a lot of that Irish heritage and history and culture and all that kind of stuff. And have been back a number of times as well. It is a super magical place Uh and music and dance is just right at the center of that culture. And being able to go there with you and 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 being able to connect with the the folks that you know there would be uh, really really spectacular. So we're gonna link all of this stuff up in the show notes, so everybody can just go to one place at themaverickshow.com. Just go to the show notes for this episode, and we are gonna have all of the stuff that we have talked about so far in this episode there, and how you can watch it and, you know, watch the episodes and, you know, check out the tours and uh, connect with Michaela and all of that good stuff. I want to sort of ask you one or two more questions before we jump into the lightning round. Yeah. Michaela, I was just watching the speech that you gave while you won your fourth Emmy. And you talk specifically in that speech, that acceptance speech about how rejection inspired your persistence. And that's been a bit of a theme that you've alluded to throughout this conversation. But I just want to ask from the perspective of what's going on internally in terms of mindset, mentally and emotionally and the self-talk and all that kind of stuff, you know, from from the beginning of your journey to now, can you talk a little bit more about what you meant when you said that at your Emmy acceptance speech? It was my fourth win but it was the first time that I thought I deserved it. First time I thought they made a mistake. The second time I thought I just got lucky. The third time I thought I just didn't think I deserved it. And then this fourth time I was like, Michaela, you do deserve this win. You won this. You know, it was the first time I felt like I actually deserved it. And that's when I had the guts to say that. I wasn't planning on saying that speech for anyone who wants to see it. It's on our, my Instagram, on my reels. It's actually the most popular post I've ever done. <laughs> it's crazy. And I think it resonates with a lot of people because of that, of how raw it is. I wasn't planning on saying that. And I was actually really nervous. It just sort of came out of my body of referring to the producers that wouldn't give me the chance. I'll say this. When I got off the stage, I got so many compliments of people being like, that was the best fuck you speech I've ever heard. (laughs) So yeah, I was so naive on how the industry worked and works. I still have to say, I feel very um, lucky that I, I don't have a show on a network because I get to make all the executive decisions I don't have an executive telling me to show more skin or to create drama or we need to have a co-host or none of that. I have nobody telling me that, which also makes this whole process really daunting because I don't have a direction of like, am I making the right choice? Am I making the right decision for the show, for me, for the story? So sometimes it's overwhelming And I'm not going to say like it's been this continuous climb for the past 11 years. Again, this is 11 years in the making of getting to this point, talking to you today. I think what's important to remember is there were so many moments where I wanted to give up. There were so many moments where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot financially do this anymore. I can't emotionally do this anymore because again, the burden of finding the funding for the show falls on me as the independent producer on public television. I don't have the network writing me a check and saying, okay, hand us 10 episodes and let's do this. It is so many times, pretty much the entire, every single episode you see, I've had to front the money somehow before, because I knew I was like, I'm going to get the money somehow. I'm going to find the funding and had to front that money and really take a risk of investing in myself. And so there were really, really, really hard moments. I think the hardest moment was Christmas two years ago, because it was right before we were going to start filming season three. And I thought season three, that should be easier to find the funding. I have a track record. I have all these accolades. I have fans. And it was the hardest to find the funding. The funding wouldn't come. The funding wouldn't come. And I said to myself, I'm not going to start shooting until I I get the money because this is crazy. I I, I just can't do this. It's not sustainable. And the, the money didn't come. And May is coming up 
and we were supposed to start filming in Italy and I, uh, for our Puglia episode. And I thought, oh my gosh, this isn't going to happen, but I know we have to make this happen. And from November through January of that previous year, I had never been at a point where I thought I can't do this. And I was at a point where I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I just cannot do this anymore. I'm just going to give up. And I know this sounds super cliche, but what kept me going, like the days where I would be like, I'm done. This is it. I can't do it. I was starting to apply for like jobs, you know, (laughs) I was applying for jobs and I would get an email from a fan who would say like, I'm going through chemotherapy and I'm watching your show and it is bringing me the only joy in my life. And I'm sitting there bawling my eyes out like, okay, I hear you. (laughs) I see you. How am I going to make this happen for her? You know, and then two days later, I get another email or message from a fan of like, I'm a teacher in a school and I've been using your shows to help teach my kids about all these amazing places around the world. And I'm like, okay, again, crying my eyes out, bawling. By the way, anybody, and, and this happens whenever I'm in New York, people come up to me all the time. It's incredible to just to be like, Oh my gosh, I love your show. It's, it's really sweet. But they don't know that as soon as I say goodbye to them, I start crying. Like I'm always crying. <laughs> I'm always crying because I'm so grateful that not just my mom is watching the show. Like I'm always like, Oh, it's just my mother watching the show. But it's amazing to be able to like walk down the street in New York city. And like a couple times a day, people stop me and, and just share with me these emotional moments of how the show has impacted them. And across the gamut of age, race, socioeconomic background. I mean, it's incredible. So that's what kept me going. I said this to my husband the other night. I said, if our show was failing, like no accolades, no Emmy Awards, no fans, it would be so easy to stop. It would be so easy to be like, I tried, I I gave it a go, moving on. But because it was so successful in the sense of all of those things, you know, as I'm trying to find funding to keep the show going, I was like, how am I supposed to give this up? How am I supposed to give this up? I I don't know how to turn around from this. Every day I struggle because now with COVID, it's, it, you know, it's becoming harder. Obviously we, the, the show's on hold, but I am grateful that I'm able to tell the stories I'm, I'm able to tell because again, no network was going to give me a chance. Now I have production companies emailing me and calling me wanting to, to pitch me to, to major streamers and, and networks, you know, but it took me four seasons to prove proof of concept, four seasons to prove that I, I'm a host, four seasons to prove that I am a really good executive producer, four seasons to prove that a show without a competition and dance works, a show about travel that isn't just food works. Uh, a show with a female host that doesn't look like any other female host works. So the impact that I've had and the feedback that I get from our viewers, it's the impact I've had and the feedback I get from other storytellers that are inspired by my journey. That's why I'm so transparent about every single moment of this process, because it's not easy. It's never been easy. And I don't want people to think that it is easy. I want them to realize it's a lot of hard work because if you want to do this too, because I get emails le- every single day, Michaela, I want to do what you're doing. Do you need, uh, do you need an assistant? Do you need a co-host? Do you need this? And it's like, this isn't easy. And if you really want to try and do this, do it, but you have to love it. You have to invest your own money and time into it. And you have to be patient because it's not going to happen overnight. And whenever I see someone who has the amount of passion that I had, I'm more than willing to help and support them because I see myself in them. You know, it's, I think, a beautiful way to live your life, to love your job. I love my job. I don't know a lot of people who can say that. And that's what I feel the most lucky is that I found something that I am so passionate about and, and really care about that I can't imagine myself doing anything else ever again. And that I feel lucky for. That's what I feel the most lucky about. That's amazing. (laughs) I think you're amazing. I think the show is amazing. I think what you're doing and all the people you're inspiring and everything is just fantastic to watch. So that's a really good place to move on to the next section. Mikella, are (laughs) you ready to move in to the lightning round? I think so. All right, let's do it. 
What is one book that has significantly impacted you over the years that you'd most recommend people check out? Hmm. I read The Alchemist a long time ago. I know that's such a cliche, but it, a friend of mine gave me that book. And uh, every once in a while, I pick that book up and just kind of revisit it to help get that love back for myself in there of like, there is this mission for me. So I would read that. Awesome. What is one travel hack that you use that you can recommend to people? I have a trick for trying to beat jet lag. So what I like to do is the second I get on the plane, especially obviously if I'm changing time zones, I change my watch to the time zone of the destination where I'm going to land. And as soon as I change that time on my watch, as soon as I sit in my seat on the plane, once we can travel again, right? Once we can change time zones again, I do whatever I'm supposed to be doing in that time zone. So let's say it's noon at J in New York and I'm wherever I'm landing, it's already 10 o'clock at night. I'm going to start winding down and go to sleep because by the time I land, I'm already catching up on acclimating myself to that time zone. Because a lot of times, especially for us, when we're traveling, by the time we land, we have to start shooting. So I have to be not tired and already in that time zone. But I think that's a really good trick is like switching your time zones before you get there, not even a few days ahead. I think that just kind of ruins like your normal life. But as soon as you get on the plane, switch your clock and start acting in the way that it is in that local time zone. And I don't eat meals on flights either. I'll either pack food because if you think about it, meals come like an hour or two after the flight takes off. So you have to wait. Then once you eat, you're still awake. If you have to go to sleep, I just never eat on the plane. Awesome advice. All right. If you could have dinner with any one person currently alive today that you've never met, who would you choose? Michelle Obama. I love her. I want to dance with her. Michelle, I always say this in every interview. <laughs> I, I like have a whole episode with just Michelle going around DC dancing or Chicago or both. Um, I just love her so much. I love the Obamas so much, but it, it would be Michelle because she just brought so much joy and dance into the White House. And I just love everything she does. Awesome. If you could go back in time, knowing everything that you know now and give one piece of advice to your 18 year old self, what would you say to 18 year old Michaela? Save your money. <laughs> Save your money. When I had like a job job, I would spend, I'd go shopping and spend on like junk. And I would say, just keep saving that money so you can spend it on travel and save it for life. But don't buy junk. <laughs> save your money. <laughs> awesome. All right. Of all of the places that you have been at this point in your life, what are your top three favorite travel destinations you would most recommend people check out? Buenos Aires. I love that place. And I know you would have to agree. Ireland. That's why it's my next Bare Feet tour. I just absolutely love Ireland. The food, the people, they're so wonderful. I honeymooned in Ireland and I've fallen in love with that place. And I go back as much as I can. And New Orleans. I absolutely love New Orleans. It's one of my favorite places because of the music. It's such a special place. I absolutely love New Orleans. And not necessarily during a Mardi Gras, just New Orleans all the time. Great picks. All right. The final question is, what are your top three bucket list destinations? These are places you've never been that are the highest on your list you would most love to see. Number one would be New Zealand because I've always wanted to dance the haka dance with the Maori people. That's number one. Number two, I've been to Mumbai. But I would love to go to India to be an extra in a Bollywood movie. So that's like experience plus travel a little bit more through India because I haven't been, I've only been to Mumbai. And number three, oh, this is a tricky one. Oh, Tanzania. Duh. I really want to go to Tanzania because there is so much music and dance there. And we were supposed to film all these destinations we were supposed to film for season four. And I know we will get back, but Tanzania, I think we're going to have to do two episodes there because there's so much music and dance. It's just 
uh, uh, I'm like a kid in a candy store. When I look at dances, I'm like, I want to go there and there and there. <laughs> That's amazing. I was in Tanzania in 2018 uh, and uh, I did East Africa in 2018. And then I spent about three months in West Africa in 2019, which is also spectacular. So wow. I'm really excited to see what you do with Sub-Saharan Africa because it's a really, really special place. So yeah. that'll be amazing. I will be staying tuned. Tell us now how folks can find you, follow you on social media, contact you and come into your world and watch all your amazing stuff. Thank you. Go to travelbarefeet.com or follow us on all the socials. It's always at Travel Bare Feet. But travelbarefeet.com connects to all of our socials. You can watch all of our episodes on the PBS app or on Amazon Prime globally. It'll link there. And you can put in your zip code if you're here in the States and find out when we're airing on your local PBS station. Amazing. We're going to link all that up in the show notes. You can get it all at one place at themaverickshow.com. Just go to the show notes for this episode. Mikella, thank you so much for being on the show. This was amazing. Thank you, Matt, for having me. This was so much fun. All right. Good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you buy cash flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber to get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals. Schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash.